And seeking the Lord's blessing, I'd like for you to please turn with me back to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. This morning we're going to be looking primarily at verse 7. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7. I'm going to pick up the reading at verse 6. This is God's holy word. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We're grateful that we can be gathered now and to meditate upon it. And, and we ask that you will be pleased to lead us and guide us and by the power of your spirit to uh, understand more of what is revealed here to us, to our edification and to your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, I want to speak to you about the government of the Lord Jesus Christ. The government of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you know about the authority and rule of Jesus Christ? And what is your relationship to Jesus Christ as King? We know from the very first page of the Bible that mankind was intended to rule over all of God's creation for his glory. This was God's intention for mankind. Let us make man in our image after our own likeness and let them have dominion, that is rule, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And this rule this kingdom, was to be experienced all under the blessing and benediction of God. That's why it says uh, that he blessed man and said, be fruitful and multiply. But as you know, sin toppled this kingdom. Mankind lost this throne. And through sin, our hearts were completely corrupted. We put ourselves under the power and government of the cosmic powers which are over this present darkness. We fell under the power of Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, the God of this world, who, although he disguises himself as an angel of light, continually blinds and deceives and brings about misery and death throughout the world. And all of the miseries and all of the pains and all of the sorrows and all of the conflicts, the murders, the wars, all of it is the result of that first sin and the continued diabolical work of Satan. When Adam lifts, listened to the untrue word and counsel of Satan rather than to the true word and counsel of the eternal creator of all things, mankind was plunged into sin and misery. But you know, God never intended to allow this fallen angel, Satan, to have the final victory and to close the door on the glorious kingdom that he had intended for mankind. Indeed, his plan had always been to magnify his own glory more and more through this glorious kingdom by redeeming mankind through his son, 
Jesus Christ. God never intended to have all mankind perish in that everlasting condition of sin, misery, and destruction. He always had a plan to establish man in the blessed condition of rule and dominion, enjoying the inheritance of one particular man who would indeed rule on the throne of David. And the way that God would accomplish this is through the birth of one unique human being, one unique person who in every way is like each one of us as a human being, except for two very unique properties. First, he would not merely be a human being. He wouldn't only have a human body and a human soul. He would also be God himself, the Son of God, the eternal creator. He would be both God and both man in one person, a divine person. And his heart, that is his human nature, would not be corrupted by sin in any way. He would not be inclined to sin, and he would never commit a sin. And that's what makes this a very unique person. Now this plan to save mankind and bring him back into the blessed condition of God's favor and into the blessed kingdom of God that was lost by Adam, this plan was first revealed to Adam and Eve while they were still in the garden. While they were still in the garden, before they were expelled from the garden, before they had conceived a child themselves, they were told about the offspring of the woman. The offspring of the woman who would come and crush the head of Satan, that is, crush and destroy his kingdom of sin, misery, and death. That was the promise. And by the way, I'll say to all of the, all of the women that this is one of the blessed things about childbirth that reminds us that salvation, the salvation of the world came through the birth of a child. And giving birth to children is a blessed thing. This is one of the reasons why it's so blessed and so important to look to it as a, as a great blessing. From that time, from that time that God first promised the coming of this unique person, God, through the centuries, was giving more and more information about his coming. More and more information. What he would be like. Uh, where he would be born. At what time in history, when he would be born. And probably most important, of whom he would be born. What family line, of all the family lines that descended from Adam, which one would he be born from? Well, he would be born of Seth, of Noah, of Shem, of Eber, of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, and of David. Now, in this verse that we're looking at, here in Isaiah chapter 9, we see one of the most well-known prophetic promises concerning the coming of this unique person. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Now that's an astonishing statement in itself. Because in that statement itself, we see the uniqueness of this person. We see that what is being said here is that this person is both human and God. These two distinct natures, both God and man, it's revealed in this one statement, for to us a child is born, to us, a son is given. In other words, to us, mankind. Mankind, through Mary, has given birth to a child. That's a, that's a human birth. To us, a child has been born. But then also, to us, a son has been given. 
one who is already a son has been given. That is to say, given from heaven. The eternal Son of God, the eternal Son of the Father, has been given to us in this birth from us. So to us, through Mary, a son has been born. But this one that's been born from man is actually the Son of God given to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So it's a remarkable statement. And it is this unique person who would sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Israel of God, the kingdom of Zion, the kingdom of God. And it is this kingdom, this rule, this government that I want to look at together with you this morning. And as we do so, I want you to think with me about three things respecting this government, this government. And the first thing that I want us to consider together is what it is. What is this government? Look at verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Verse 6 says that the government shall be upon his shoulder. The government. What is it talking about? Well, it's the government primarily of his kingdom, the church, his people, the elect. The increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So let's look at this, this government, what it is. Well, Jesus himself tells us something of his kingdom. He tells us a great deal about his kingdom, as a matter of fact, but... Think about what he said to Pontius Pilate. Do you remember Jesus speaking to Pontius Pilate about his kingdom? You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. Christ came into the, the world to be king and to have a government given to him. But he says, my kingdom is not of this world. He says, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. So the kingdom, which is primarily in view here in this promise, the kingdom primarily refers to this kingdom that is not of this world. It's not a kingdom that arises from the sea of humanity. It's not a kingdom that comes down it's not a kingdom that comes by, by the ingenuity of man. It's a kingdom that comes down from heaven. It's not a kingdom that's like the political kingdoms of the world. It's not defined by a border or a territory. You know what it's like to cross a border and enter into another country. Uh, their police officers look different. Their flags look different. They have different laws many of the times. It's not like that kind of a kingdom. It's not like the worldly kingdoms of this age. It's not defended and maintained by military power. It's not political. Earthly government exercises its control externally. Right? The government says, here's the law. Do it and you'll be fine. Don't do it and you stare down the uh, barrel of a gun or some other form of the sword. And this is what Pilate saw as a kingdom. There's Pilate standing there, a governor of an earthly kingdom, an earthly empire. And he was there to maintain the order of that empire, that kingdom, by means of the sword that had been given him to do that job. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus said, my kingdom is not like the one which you are governing, Pilate. I don't have soldiers. I don't use a sword. I'm not attempting to carve out uh, an earthly territory in that way and to put up walls and barriers and defend it. You know, you can see earthly kingdoms, can't you? You can see them. 
they say in the news, at least I hear some things in the news, to this extent that uh, Russia may be building up troops on the border of Ukraine. Have you heard of any of this? Or China building up a huge naval presence in the South China Sea, uh, perhaps threatening Taiwan's independence and so on. Will there be a war? Will there be an expansion of some of these earthly kingdoms? You can see that taking place. But Christ's kingdom is different. Because it's a kingdom that is within people. It's in their heart. It's a rule that occurs from within the soul of people. In other words, it's a spiritual kingdom. The rule of Jesus Christ, the government of Christ, is a government and a rule by His Holy Spirit in the hearts of people. It's a kingdom that's governed through spiritual means. The Word of God. The Scriptures. Reading and meditating upon them. Praying to God. Worshiping God. Listening to preaching. Fellowshipping with Christians. Praising God. These are the spiritual means. Enjoying the sacraments. These are all the spiritual means that God has given to put that kingdom and grow that kingdom in the hearts of individuals. You know, Jesus was asked about his kingdom. He was asked, when will your kingdom come? When will it come? And Jesus said, the kingdom of God will not come with observable signs, nor will people say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. In other words, it's in your hearts. It's a spiritual kingdom. It doesn't come in the form of a marching army with tanks and jeeps and flags. No, it takes over souls. It's something that's unseen. Now, it's very interesting that Jesus tells, this, uh, tells us this about his kingdom in two parables that he puts together. If you turn to Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13 and verses 31 to 33, <clears throat> he tells us two things about, or he tells us about his kingdom using two parables put together. Look at what he says here. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. <coughs> it is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come <clears throat> and make its nests in the branches. <clears throat> he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour, <clears throat> till it all leavened. All right, so this is a rare occasion. I've never had my voice actually start to really go out. Can someone please run and get me a glass of water? It's a unique experience. I've never had this before, I don't think. <clears throat> I've been known to forget things, but this is a doozy. Okay. Elenica properly equipped me this morning with this napkin, so <clears throat> I have that. What two things are we taught about the kingdom in these parables? One thing is that it does grow <clears throat> and it does conquer. It will overcome and displace the kingdoms of the earth. However, it doesn't come like the kingdoms of the earth. It doesn't come by tanks and swords and flags. It comes like leaven. It comes like leaven. It happens mysteriously. It happens beneath the surface. You don't see leaven at work. It's somewhere in the dough. You see the effects of leaven as it grows. 
and so too the effects of the spiritual government of Christ in the hearts of men. This government, this kingdom of David, it's a kingdom of grace of which Christ was made king after the order of Melchizedek, who was a king and a priest. Notice our verse here in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7. At the end, or in the second, he says, um, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. <clears throat> that is to say, thank you, Marco. Thank you very much. To establish it with justice and righteousness. Christ's kingdom is a kingdom of peace. But that peace begins with establishing a peace between man the sinner and the holy God. And that can only come about through the sacrificial work of Christ on the cross. You know, the reason why earthly kings are desired. Why do we even want kings? Why would anyone want a king? You know, there are some anarchists who, of course, don't want kings. They say, I don't want any government at all. Just leave me be. What is the saying? Don't tread on me or something like this. Libertarians want no government at all, but that's not biblical. Why, what is the reason why we want kings and nations want leaders? Well, they want leaders to deliver them from enemies and to govern them in a way that they can live peaceful lives in fairness and justice and safety. Well, Jesus came into the world to deliver us from the ultimate enemy, the highest enemy, sin, Satan, and judgment. And not only, not only through these things, but all that result from them. But you see, the only way that our King Jesus could save us from these enemies was by dying on the cross. That's the only way it could happen. That's why the kingdom of Christ just didn't begin in glory. He didn't just say, I'm here now the king and here are the Ten Commandments and that's it. No, justice had to be satisfied. Sin had to be paid for. An offering had to be made. The offering up of his life as a sacrifice on the cross. The justice of God was satisfied and peace between God and sinners like you and me was established through that sacrifice. And so we read of the typology of the kings of old. Like Abraham, for example, when he delivered Lot in the War of the Kings. He rescued them from those enemies. Or Moses, bringing Israel out of Egypt, delivering them from their enemies. Or all of the judges who would deliver the people from the bondage and tyranny of these enemies. So too, Christ would deliver us from the bondage and tyranny of Satan and sin through his sacrificial work on the cross. And then the Holy Spirit poured into our hearts to cleanse and sanctify us. This is why the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world in humility. His kingdom could not be established apart from his first dealing with our sins. You know, you think of a war between nations, and when you think about peace, in order for a nation that goes to war with another nation to get peace, uh, two things might happen. There might be a war and there's complete destruction and then you might end the conflict, but the cities are still demolished in rubble. You, you don't really have peace there. In one sense you have peace because the enemy's been defeated, but you, you also need the city to be rebuilt. And this is what Christ did. He came into the world, he died upon the cross, he defeated the enemy. And then through the gracious influence of his spirit, he's building up the city, as it were, bringing 
peace. Bringing peace. So his kingdom is a spiritual kingdom of grace. It's established by his sacrificial death on the cross for our sins. It's a kingdom governed by spiritual means in the hearts of men. And wherever you find people who hear the gospel and believe it and become willing disciples of Christ, that is where you see the kingdom of God in the midst of people. And this is what is primarily in view here in these verses where it speaks about the government being upon Christ's shoulders. But you know, there's another aspect to this. There's another aspect to this that's very important. And that is that Christ, as this king who rules this spiritual kingdom, that Christ has all authority and power over all things. Everything is under the control and power of Christ. Not one hair can fall from any head in this room without his command or permission. And so in the Gospels, we see Jesus healing every kind of disease, the blind, the deaf, the mute, the lame, the epileptic, the bleeding, the feverish, even the dead. He has power over it all. We see him exercising control and authority over demons. We see him in control and over the air, the sky, the wind, the waves, the trees. Jesus has all authority and power. He's in control of the entire universe and everything that it contains. I think it's John Newton that said something to the effect of, I read the newspapers just so I can see how my Savior is ruling over all things for my good. That's a nice quote, isn't it? I read the newspapers just to see how my Savior is ruling over all things for my good. And this is something that we need to remember. That Christ, who is ruling over his church, has authority over all things. Is Christ ruling in your heart? Do you know the peace of the Lord through his reign? So the first thing that we're looking at then, what it is. Secondly, I want us to look at what this kingdom is doing. What is this kingdom doing? Look down at our verse again. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. The kingdom of Christ, the government of the Lord Jesus, is increasing. It's increasing. This is why I said that the kingdom of grace is what is primarily in view here. That is to say the gospel kingdom, the church. That's what's in primarily in view here. Because we know that the, the authority and power that Christ has, what's often called the kingdom of power and his authority of all things, that doesn't increase. Right? That doesn't increase. At the Great Commission, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He didn't say some authority has been given. I have most authority over most things. No, he said I have authority over everything. So that can't increase. He already has all of that. No, he goes on to say, therefore, go and make disciples. And so the increase of disciples is what is in view here. Not the universal power that he has over all things, which all must and do uh, obey, submit to, whether they uh, like to or not, but the increase and growth of his kingdom of grace. Go and make disciples. This is the church that is increasing. Christ is building his church. It is growing and it will continue to grow. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe that his kingdom, the church, is growing? 
this prophecy in this verse is speaking about our present time. This New Testament age, the gospel age. This is the advancement, the time of advancement of the kingdom of God. And it says here that this increase of his government is not going to stop. It's going to continue. Don't be shaken by anything you see or read on the internet. Don't be shaken by it. Because the word of God tells us that the government of Christ over the hearts of people will continue to increase. It will continue to increase. And everything else that's happening is by his authority and control. Now this growth and this increase might not be uniform. It's like a growth of a plant. Sometimes, you know, a, a plant can go through a, a, a time of drought and it doesn't seem to grow at all. Sometimes it looks like it's almost dead, but then it revives. And then there are seasons when it flourishes. But over the long haul, you know, if you ever see that time-lapse photography, then you'll see the plant grow and grow and grow. How is it growing? Well, it's growing both in number and maturity. You see a young family, young married family, and they're having children, and, and they're having more and more children. And you think every time another baby's born, then you're saying, ah, their family's growing, right? Because there's more and more children being given to the family. It's growing. That's one way to speak about a growing family. And then there's another way to speak about a growing family. You see a, a family that is not having more children, but the children that they have are getting older and more mature. And you can say there's a growing family. And the church itself grows in terms of its number and in terms of its maturity. And it will increase and continue to increase. The worldly nations, earthly kingdoms, they continually fall and are displaced. But Christ's kingdom and his government won't. It will continue to grow. Now a question to explore at another time is the question of to what extent will the church permeate the nations of the earth before the earth or before the Lord Jesus comes again? Will the church continue among the nations in a state of stagnant growth? A small fragment of people within the nations of the earth and that pretty much stays the same until Christ returns or will it continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller until the return of Christ? Such that when Jesus does return, there's only a handful of true believers in all the nations of the earth. Or, will the kingdom of Christ so increase in the earth and among the nations that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord covers the, the earth as the waters cover the sea? Well, we'll explore that at another time. I do believe the last view, mind you, but I'm not going to take time to explore that at this point. It's enough for us to know and to be encouraged by what these words say that Christ's kingdom can never be thwarted. It can never be thwarted. The gates of hell cannot resist the expansion of the kingdom of Christ. It's a marvelous thing to think of, isn't it? When Jesus saves a sinner, there's nothing Satan can do. He cannot stop that. Well then, let's consider the third thing. The third thing here about the, the government of Christ and its never-ending increase in this age is uh, how does this happen? How does this increase happen? Why does it happen? Well, look at verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, I don't think anyone here would doubt God's ability to increase his kingdom. 
I don't think anyone would doubt that, that God is able to increase his, in, his kingdom. What we wonder about and struggle with is what his desire is to do. Does God want to expand his kingdom? We know that the Lord can increase his spiritual kingdom, but is that his will? Is this something that he wants to do? Well, here we see in God's word that it is the Lord's ardent desire to preserve and extend the kingdom of Christ. God is here showing us that he has a passion and an uncommon drive to continue to advance the authority, the government of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a man that I read about uh, recently named Simon George. And he happened to build the biggest model train in England. How much would you spend on a train if you're going to build a model train? He spent some $430,000 building a model train in his basement. Two and a half miles of track. Over 10,000 individual little plants that he made. And he spent some six years full time since his retirement working on this model train. And you know what he said in an interview? He said, and this is profound, one can't accomplish something like this without passion. In other words, without zeal. You have to be all in on this in order to see this thing through, in order to go through all of the labor and the meticulous detail to construct this entire train set, all of the expenditure, it takes zeal. Well, here we see the Lord speaking about his own zeal for the kingdom of his beloved son. The zeal of the Lord. That is what is behind the increase of his government. And this should be a great encouragement to every Christian in our effort to spread the gospel. Since we know that the Lord is zealous for this, that it is his desire, then we ought to have that same desire. And as we do so, we can remember that it is his zeal that is leading ours, not the other way around. In other words, God's interest in spreading the gospel and advancing his kingdom is not due to our desire in that work. It is not us who stirs up God as if we think, you know, I'd like to see the church advance in the world and let's pray for it, let's work for it and then maybe God will get excited for us and he'll want to come alongside us and be excited in this work that we want to do. No. As a matter of fact, we are taught that in the promise that God made to David. You remember when David said, I shouldn't be living in a palace and God's in a tent. I want to build a, a temple for the Lord. He had this zeal to see God's house built. And God came and reminded him through Nathan the prophet, no, 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 no. It's not about your zeal to have this done. I've already had this plan. And I, through my son, am going to build this church. So it is the Lord who excites us into evangelism, excites us into seeing his church and the increase of Christ's government expand. And may indeed he do that in each of our hearts. Well, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the giving of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the zeal of the Lord to see his kingdom grow and expand in all the earth. And we thank you to be part of that kingdom, even in our own present day and age. And, O oh Lord, we pray that you would be pleased to continue that great expansion of this kingdom. 
grant that it would continue to grow in our own hearts and lives, in our families, in our local churches, and as well, we pray that you would bring more and more into this kingdom through the gracious proclamation of the gospel. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.